Welcome friends to this episode of the Sync Your Life podcast. I am really excited to dig into today's conversation. It's not very often that I get to sort of nerd out with someone who is in the natural medicine world. Um, I'm meeting today with Dr. Laura Brown. She is a naturopath out of Canada, and we've had the great fortune of having a little bit of a pre-conversation before this, and I didn't want that call to end, so I'm super excited to ask even more questions today and to really dig into her wisdom and knowledge as it pertains to natural wellness. So I want to let her just sort of introduce herself here and kind of tell us, you know, where you're from, how you got to doing what you're doing and the mission that you're on to serve. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jenny. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, So I'm a naturopathic doctor. I'm practicing in Ontario, Canada. So I am I'm bound by kind of my regulations to practice within my province, which is great in some regards, but unfortunate because I can't reach out in other ways. But this is one way that I do get to reach out. And I just love um, meeting lots of folks on on their podcasts and having some really great conversations. And I learned so much through them, which is wonderful. I kind of got out into, into the podcast world after I published my book in 2021 called Beyond Digestion, How the Gut Connects to Your Mind, Body and Soul. It's available on Amazon worldwide. And um, I wrote that because I really needed to um, find my voice. Um, Being a naturopathic doctor is my second career. And I come into it because I'd had my own health issues and it kept, you know, the the career kept knocking on my door and it was like not going away. And it was like, either I'm either I'm going to like slam this door shut or I'm going to walk through it. And, um, and I walked through it. So it meant going back to school It meant um, lots of dedication and time away from my family in order to um, to work through everything. But now I've been practicing for about seven years. And, you know, that goes with kind of my lifetime of experience of, you know, health issues that I've had myself, obviously gut being um, one of them that really, um, you know, really was something that I needed to learn more about. So this is part of my journey, I think. And the book has... um, information, not just about my, my journey, but but about a lot of my patients. Uh, Because when you, you know, as you find you get into practice, you start to attract people with similar issues, because you can, you know, share stories, and you can help each other. And I know that's why you're doing what you're doing. And this is why we do things we, you know, we're all on a learning journey, nobody knows everything. And um, we just always have to have that child's heart of fascination with um, how the bodies knit together. Um, It's just such a fascinating, fascinating thing. Yes, absolutely. And I did, I ordered your book. I actually have it sitting right here. I'm taking it with me on vacation next week. I can't wait to dive in deeper to it, but this whole idea of, you know, digestion and the gut microbiome and and all this is, I would say a trendy topic amongst podcasters. It's something that I've seen recently kind of popping up to the surface on a lot of different shows that I listen to and, and things that I read. Um, and it's interesting because I remember a long time ago, uh, an apothecary pharmacist who's been quite a mentor to me and and just teaching me a lot about hormone health. He was talking to me about something that I teach my my listeners and my sync course takers, which is what we call the four-legged hormone chair. And we were talking about, you know, your your sex hormones and your thyroid and your cortisol and blood sugar are all these four legs of a hormone chair. And then he asked me the question, well, do you have any idea what the ground is that the chair sits on? He said, do you know what the foundation is for the chair? And I thought, Oh, I have no idea. And he said, it's your gut. He's like, it's the gut. So I I would love to talk to you more about, you know, since the gut really is foundational to our overall health, like what types of things do you see most commonly? Um, And, you know, what are some issues that I'm sure a lot of it is pertaining to, you know, the fact that people are not necessarily using food as medicine. I think there's a huge mistreatment, obviously, of of the way our, our food system, especially I can speak for the United United States, um, our, our sad diet, the standard American diet is certainly not serving us when it comes to our gut. So I'd love for you to just sort of, from a general perspective, talk to us about this idea of, of proper digestion and the gut microbiome and how some people are suffering with issues that derive from that. Absolutely. Um, you know, the top line things we see so much of nowadays is anxiety and depression. I mean, that's so prevalent throughout society. And there's a lot of, um, prescriptions based on those two conditions. I argue, and the science backs me up, that um, these are often symptoms of poor gut health. They're not diagnoses unto themselves. So what we're seeing in in, in mood disorders, as well as in a lot of chronic diseases, 
those things are just symptoms of what's going on in the gut. Hippocrates, our father of medicine, said 2,450 years ago, it all starts in the gut. And I think he knew much more than we could ever give him credit for. That's just unbelievable. I mean, 99% of our genes are not us. They're our microbiome. We carry around a ton of information in us, in our gastrointestinal tract, in our microbiome, because our microbiome is not just in our gut. Our microbiome is actually everywhere, but our gut is like the, the main part of it, our large intestine being the huge component of where a lot of these things per pervade. And there's like seven main families and then lots of different species um, of ones that serve us well, that we're quite symbiotic living with them, meaning that we serve one another. They, um, they make vitamins, they make minerals um, available to us. They help us with our hormone um, balance. They help us turn on genes. They have biological clocks just like we do. So when our biological clock gets messed up, like um, when we travel and have jet lag or stay up too late, then they get, they, they get upset too, right? Mm -hmm. They have a routine and um, they like it. And um, that's all very, very important. And what we feed, when we think we're feeding ourselves, we're feeding them first, mm -hmm. right? Like we absorb stuff through our small intestine, but then they're fermenting what, you know, what's not getting um, broken down in the small intestine. They're fermenting a lot and then you know, producing these things called short chain fatty acids. And the balance of those, there's like four or five main ones that um, really make a difference in feeding, you know, feeding our lining of our cells. Um, making a difference in what's going on throughout the rest of our body. They're finding different levels of short chain fatty acids um, are linked to different types of diseases or different um, dysbiosis or overgrowth of, of one type of bacteria or, or yeast or whatever um, are now linked. And they don't know what comes first. Is it the disease that makes it or is it that kind of now sets the, 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 the you know, that, that playing field for the yeah. disease? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because as someone who works with a lot of women in particular, who are coming in to my course, wanting to learn more about their hormones, I'm always so shocked at, at the number of women. And I can actually say this for myself too, who have been plagued with digestive issues that they at least feel and see. I mean, I understand that there are a lot of times where, you know, um, maybe you don't think maybe because you're, you're dealing with anxiety or depression, you don't necessarily make that connection to the gut. Right. But there are also some sort of digestive discomfort issues that I think plague women uh, in particular. And this is something that I hear about quite often. And that is just this inability to eliminate waste. This, this constipation concept is so prevalent, at least amidst women who are coming into my course dealing with what they think is hormone imbalance. And so sometimes we have to look at like, right, like, okay, well, what's the first thing that you can do to really make sure that you are more regular with your digestive habits. And I know fiber is obviously a big, a big thing. You know, I don't think most Americans are getting enough fiber, but is this something that you see a lot that women are just having trouble with um, regularity in their digestion and what types of tips would you offer that woman? Yeah, I, I do see, you know, it's always the, you know, irritable bowel syndrome, which is just that alternating, um, you know, loose stool or diarrhea to the constipation constipation for some people means just, you know, difficult to pass stools. Technically constipation is not going for days. And sometimes you get both. And this can be um, from a disruption in the microbiome, as you said, lack of fiber. I mean, the fiber is what those guys, you know, what the microbes are feeding off of, right? We just talked about it a minute ago. Most people would get around maybe five, eight grams of fiber a day. And our bodies need 35. Now that doesn't mean that tomorrow you go out and try to get 35 grams of fiber because that would just be a shock to your system. You, you slowly build it up and you build it up with like vegetables, you know, a little bit of fruit, but not too much. And then, you know, what are you getting? You know, grains aren't always the best because so many people are sensitive to them now. So it's finding alternative things that you can use in order to help. And, you know, we, we look at, you know, things that also act as, you know, prebiotics or things that feed you know, asparagus, onions, garlic, Jerusalem, artichoke, inulin, chicory, um, chicory root, uh, you know, and then you look at flax and psyllium, you know, sometimes they work for people, sometimes not. So the, the list goes on. So it's often looking at things like that. And then foods that would often stop people up is dairy and cheese and you know, dairy and eggs, sorry, cheese is part of dairy. Um, 
eggs sometimes get classified as dairy, but technically they're not. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, it's, sometimes it's, you know, taking those things out sugar, we get way too much sugar in our diet on a, on a general basis. And, and that's just really hard. You have to think 80% of our immune system, um, is in our gut, right? The, the number keeps going up last time it was like over 70, but it's like closer to 80. That's, that's a big part, but this is where we meet most of our environment and, um, sugar is really hard on the immune system. So if, if, you know, if you're, you're bashing your immune system with a lot of sugar, then it's going to have difficulties doing its daily tasks, right? So the elimination is huge because this is where our toxins are. This is what we have to excrete. So if we're not getting enough water, we're not getting enough fiber. Those are two main things. And then anxiety um, often, you know, is, is contributed to it. And this is, you know, in stress. And I mean, lots of people have that. We're in a go, go, go society and we're constantly in that fight or flight. And what's the opposite of fight or flight is the rest and digest. Now, Stephen Porges has a polyvagal theory, which talks about five different states of the nervous system, which is quite interesting and worth a conversation all on its own. But to, um, to sum up what's going on between the brain and the gut and mood, mood disorders, we have a vagal nerve, which is our, our cranial nerve 10, which starts up in our brain, but then comes down and it innervates so many organs within our digestive tract. And if we are ancient cavemen and we're running out and the tiger's coming to chase us, of course, our digestion is going to shut down. All of the blood is getting shunted out to the muscles so that you can run and save yourself. This is a survival mechanism. Now, nowadays, it's not really a tiger chasing us and we're not running to, to burn all this off. Um, we're sitting at a desk, you know, getting frustrated with a task that we, um, we feel overwhelmed with or family dynamics that we're overwhelmed with. We have not um, grown up um, with a lot of emotional regulation skills, mm -hmm. which is sad. And, you know, energy gets stuck in places. And this, this um, often shows up in, in the gut track. And this is the classic syndrome of, you know, anxiety or depression with your irritable bowel syndrome. Um, they kind of come, come together and you have to work on them at both ends. Yeah. 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 And I, I'm so glad you said that. And I, I do want to come back to talking about sugar in a minute, but I, one thing that I just want to say from my own experience is <clears throat> I was that person who prob probably starting in college, I started to notice that my body was not as regular as my friends. Like I wasn't, you know, I was, I was constantly bloated and dealing with lots of issues um, digestively. And it was probably about six years later when my husband and I decided to embrace this elimination diet um, and it was really more of like a detox. It was a healthy detox using a lot of fruits and vegetables and increasing your fiber intake. And what it did was over the course of three weeks, it eliminated animal product and, and dairy just to see if we could sort of cleanse the gut. And I came away from that three weeks feeling the best I had ever felt and feeling regular. And I, I wasn't bloated. I, I wasn't having the headaches that I normally have. And so my doctor at that point sent me in for some lab work to see if I had any food sensitivities. She's like, I think we should maybe do some panels here and see what's going on. So we did a food sensitivity test and it came back and I was, I was like in the red on dairy sensitivity. She was like, you were so extremely sensitive to dairy and wheat um, for that matter. And I think eggs were up there as well. Um, and she's like, you know, if you, if you could eliminate these foods that are causing stress to your body, if you could eliminate this extra inflammation, you know, you will feel better. I have no doubt. And so it's interesting because I remember telling my mom, and of course she only knew what she knew at that time, but everybody does the best they can. But when I told her, I was at 25 years old, I said, I think I have a dairy, pretty strong dairy sensitivity. And she was like, oh, that's so funny. You did when you were a baby. And I thought, well, I don't think I ever outgrew it. Like, I think, I think it just sort of stuck with me and I've just been suffering for so long. So anyway, all this to say, you know, I've, I've seen this be the case for so many people where they, whether they're having digestive issues or not, they do something like a cleanse or something that really shows them like, oh, well, maybe these foods are causing some issues for me. And, or maybe, maybe I'm not um, able to digest as much as I thought I was. And so they have food, food sensitivity tests that can really sort of change the game for them. Is, are those types of tests things that you do in your practice? And, and if so, what type of testing do you recommend with that? Absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned the food sensitivity because it is an area that, um, you know, we're always looking at it. Of course, you can start, you know, without doing any testing, you can start with like what you had done, just a, a basic, let's cut back on like 
you know, pretty much the ones that are top line, the gluten, the dairy, the sugar, and, um, and you know, usually, you know, start with that, see if that's helping make a difference because it kind of helps clean the slate a little bit. Um, and then there's different types of food sensitivity testing you can do. There is um, obviously the IgE, which I always say E for immediate, even though it starts with an I, but IgE for immediate, that's like your food allergy. That's your anaphylactic, you know, what you would typically see with somebody like, you know, choking and eyes puffing up and shortness of breath and maybe some hives, things like that. So that's an outright, you know, strong reaction from that part of your immune system because you have um, a lot of different parts of your immune system. So that's one. And that's one that you sometimes might go to the, the you know, immunologist and get a skin prick test to see what kind you're reacting to things. So that's something um, from that regard. That's, you know, normally I'm seeing with the gas pain blow, it's more of the IgG um, type of reaction. And that happens within like three minutes to three days. It's very vague. Mm -hmm. So who knows what they ate, you know, for breakfast half the time versus, you know, three days ago and then everything all combined. So it's quite difficult to parse it apart. So doing the testing can be helpful. Um, but the IgG blood testing, I find it's, it's okay. And it gives us some window in my experience. It's not as accurate as I would like it to be. We have to take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, sometimes when we're overeating a particular food, it might show up high. And that's where, you know, I use them as a guided elimination tool so that we can say, okay, that, you know, say eggs are coming up really high. So we take them out for depending on what the symptoms are, like one to three months, and then maybe we introduce them, you know, and we're introducing the foods that we're taking out one at a time so that we can watch them over a course of like one to three days to see what's happening. Um, so that's the IgG blood test. And then there's another blood test that, um, that gets run. Um, it's called the LCAT test. And they're actually taking your white blood cell and they're introducing the food um, protein to that, to your white blood cell one at a time. And they're kind of repeating that test. This one's recognized by Stanford university. It is a little more costly, but Hey, if you're going to get a test run, just blow the wad and get it done because it'll really help you see what's happening. Yeah. Um, that one I think would be my most reliable blood test. What I do often in clinic, which is cheap and cheerful, it's not approved by Health Canada, not meant to diagnose or treat anything, but man, I've used it on hundreds of patients and we find really good results putting together a guided elimination diet with a bioimpedance testing. So what we do is we, everything in the world has a vibration and we have the vibrational qualities of the food into the computer database. And then I'm using, um, basically like a, you know, like a, a metal wand and, and, um, and, a, and like a pen kind of thing. And we're passing that electrode, you know, that electronic vibration through, and we're just measuring the reaction of the nervous system. Okay. And it helps us. And, you know, then as we're interpreting it, we have like, you know, it'll show us foods that your body's like pretty inert to. It's like, yeah, nah, you know, you can eat that anytime. I really don't care. Great. You can have those. And then we have ones that are kind of the outliers on either side of that you know, kind of our bell curve, right? Um, that are like, you know what? If you were to not eat these every day, maybe rotate them, okay? Or reduce how many, how much of it you're eating, or maybe even remove, depending on how sensitive the individual appears to be testing. Um, those are kind of our cautionary ones. And then we have the kind of the outliers on either side, the things that are really stressing you and the things that are, you know, making you weak. And those things we're avoiding and we're avoiding those for three months and then reintroducing one at a time. And that's kind of the process that we would go with people. And I'm always amazed at, you know, people going, oh, I'm not surprised by my results. I kind of knew that. If we're quiet enough in our own body, we already kind of know that often, you know, we're not um, also trained on trusting our intuition or, or our cut sense, so to speak. Um, but we, we know. Um, there's only a few times where people are, you know, say they're surprised or shocked. And usually it's because they really love eating that food, but they know it bothers them and they're just in denial. Yes. So there's, there's that side of it too. And it can be shocking for people and you have to be careful doing the food sensitivity, any kind of that testing with people who have had, you know, food addictions or food, um, you know, like anorexia or bulimia. You want to be gentle with those people because sometimes running those tests can make them more vigilant and hypersensitive to what's going on. So you, you want to kind of um, screen for that first mm -hmm. and just get a sense for what's going on. Because sometimes um, they are super sensitive and it could just be, 
you know, looking at things a bit of a different way. Absolutely. It's, I laughed when you said that about people not wanting to give up certain foods because I was that way. <clears throat> I was, I used, I used to joke that I would come home for lunch every day. And when I was working my corporate job and I would, I would eat like half a box of Cheez-Its or I would just slice up the cheese and eat cheese at lunch. I was almost cheese addicted. And I know that there is some science out there on sort of the addictive properties of cheese. I know that that's a very real thing. And if I, if I had to say, I would say most women, when they come into my course and I say, Hey, you know, dairy tends to be a little inflammatory. Um, a lot of women are sensitive to it. Maybe consider removing it. Actually, it's not in any of my, any of my meal plans that I offer in my course, because I just know how inflammatory dairy can be. And it's funny because most of the time women will say, what? Like, I can't give up my cheese. Like, or they think they don't consume dairy because they don't drink cow's milk. And I'm like, well, but you're consuming so much cheese in your day to day that cheese is also dairy. Right. And so just the simple change of, of, of eating foods and meals that don't contain dairy can have such an impact on people who are coming into this with, you know, having, having it for every meal, having it with their eggs in the morning, having it with their lunch on their salad. Like if you're continuously having something that's causing uh, inflammation for you, or, or if you're sensitive to it, right, that's not serving you. So I understand it's hard to do. And there are addictive properties to, to things like cheese and sugar um, that make it really hard to break. I do want to talk about sugar uh, as well, because I know Dr. Mark Hyman, who I listen to on his podcast, he talks a lot about sugar being obviously the number one drug um, sort of openly sold around the world, right? Like everyone is sort of sugar addicted. Can you talk to us a little bit about sugar? Absolutely. Um, I just want to mention one thing about milk first, because sometimes people think if they're, you know, it's, it's the milk sugar, as we're talking about sugar, and that's lactose. And some people can be lactose intolerant, but they can also be casein and whey, which are the milk proteins intolerant. So there's different types of sensitivities against the milk. And it's the insulin growth factor, number one, that is, you know, part of the inflammatory process in the milk products amongst the hormones that they give the cows and whatnot. So um, just a little empt on that. Coming into sugar, so yes, milk sugar is one thing, but then we're thinking usually about the avert sugar, you know, from the cane sugar, that type of thing. But sugar, you know, exists in fruit naturally. It exists in like coconut, like coconut sugar. It exists in molasses, which is like that raw, you know, stuff. And, and it's so prevalent, even balsamic vinegar, very sugary, right? Now wine, you're fermenting and you're taking out some of the sugars. So it's a bit different, but you're dealing with the alcohol. Um, but sugar itself in its, you know, in its format is more addictive than cocaine. And when I wrote that in my book, Jenny, the, the editor said, Laura, you got to back this up, you know, and I have like scientific evidence, you know, backed up and all of the references uh, in my book. And I could probably, you know, have a whole book of references on top of that. But um, they said, you got to back this up because people won't believe you. And uh, well, easy, you know, like, so, you know, 10 minutes later, here's like 50 studies on it. I remember the National Geographic doing a whole like front page thing on it about 10 years ago, but we are addicted to sugar, right? And our consumption of sugar just goes up and up and up and up. And it's hidden in so many foods, especially processed foods. And um, yes, people are addicted. And, you know, I can have women come in and they eat really, really well, but then they, they binge on their Reese's pieces or they binge on um, you know, gummy bears or, you know, whatever, you know, they just, they, their ice cream, you know, oh, but it's yo yogurt or, oh, but it's coconut ice cream. Oh, but it's, you know, gelato. No, it's, it's still sugar. And it's just, you know, it's still an issue. And because it changes and wires your brain, your dopamine sectors in your brain, similar to cocaine, but even stronger, um, you know, you need more and more and more. Yeah. What I often use to help stop that sugar addictive craving, because, you know, your, your body's going like, I need sugar. And you'd be like, no, 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 I'm fine. And it's like, no, I need sugar. This can sometimes be um, an overgrowth of candida because candida yeast um, often overgrows, especially in women, because it overgrows with um, the use of oral birth control pills and um, hormones that we, we take um, as a, you know, from the outside in and, um, so, so it makes us very susceptible to that and antibiotic use will increase the level of yeast in that. And it's not just the overt, I have a yeast infection in my vaginal tract. It could be like red beefy rashes. It could be a coated white tongue or it, it you know, it can be come up in, in other ways, itches, rashes, you know, like um, other fungal rashes, right? You know, ringworm, tinea, you know, athlete's foot, you know, scalp stuff, sometimes joint pain, sometimes headaches. 
So it's going after the candida and going after that sugar addiction. So gymnema, which is an ancient Ayurvedic herb, you just need drops of it. And I just tell people take drops of it. Um, I'll, I'll give them a bottle of it because I have like a whole apothecary of plant medicines and um, do it for two weeks, three times a day. What it does is it takes the taste pleasure of sugar away for about an hour or two for most people. So, so I dose it throughout yeah. the day. So if you take it and then you go to eat your favorite treat and you're, it's just kind of like, Mwah. right. It doesn't, you don't have the taste, yeah. you know, exciting you. So it's not firing up those centers in the brain. So it starts to rewire your, you know, your reward center, right. Cause sugar is a reward. dopamine means our reward chemical. Um, so, so it's that. And then I would say, then you would just take it as needed after that. So it's not something you have to take forever. And then if there's like potential for candida overgrowth, we're going after that with lots of antimicrobials, um, doing a gut reset in order to help work with that. And, um, it can be difficult, right? It can be difficult to modulate. And I mean, I went through it and, oh, I was, I was angry because it was just like, oh yeah. my gosh, you see everybody else eating stuff and you're like, why can they eat that? Why can't I eat it? What's wrong with me? What did I do wrong? Why do I deserve this? And that little chatterbox in your ear just goes on and on and on and on. And eventually you just have to tell that little chatterbox just to shut up. Yeah. And um, like it has served its purpose. You are done with it. It can leave now. Thank you very much. Be gone. <laughs> And, um, and you, you, you know, you almost have to voice what you're saying. Okay. I'm hungry. No, am I hungry or am I anxious? Um, you know, what's the sugar doing for me? Um, and if it's a reward, then it's finding, you know, we always think eat is treat, mm -hmm. right. Or treat is eat. And it's not right. Our dogs do too. Right. But, um, treat can also be other things, right. Yeah. So it was finding other things for a reward. Maybe it's, you know, doing something you wouldn't normally do, you know, going and buying your favorite magazine, having an extra long bath, going for a walk, you know, picking up a new craft, right? Like um, you just paint or draw, um, do, you know, you do something creative so that you can engage your mind and, and start working on things, you know, spend time with family and friends, watch a funny movie, make yourself laugh, right? I, um, yeah, one thing that, and I, I don't wanna interrupt you, but I, I do wanna sort of add this in. I think often about my five-year-old and I think about how, we, we talk about food in our family. Um, we talk about it as fuel. So we, we like to talk about, you know, okay, are you reaching for that? Because you most likely are having some sort of blood sugar crash and you think it's going to give you energy, right? So is this food going to give me energy or is it not? And I think it's, it's interesting because it's, there's such a fine line, um, especially in our society, right? Like we've, my family has become known for like, being the token preschool family who like my child brings her own snack because we're not okay with like the dairy that's being served or we're not okay with the refined sugar that's being served at snack time. And this is something that I've been asked a lot about recently. And I'm, so I'm going to kind of, I'm going to circle back in this, in this story, in this story. Um, but basically I just think it's unfortunate that there, that sugar is so much in, as part of our culture um, to the, to the degree that I have a friend of mine who is actually reaching out to her child's school because she's so upset with how much sugar is being given to the kids at school. And I'm not even talking about like lunch hour. I'm talking about as rewards, right? If they, if they're, if, if something is, is done appropriately in the classroom, they're being given sugar as a reward. And this is something that we've come across too. Like now that my child is entering school age and we're having those conversations with her school about what we, you know, what we find is okay. What, what is not okay. You know, we have you, sort of the, the two sides of the coin where there's, okay, we want to keep things healthy. We want to talk about food as fuel and we want to be giving her things that give her energy. But at the same time in this society, it can be really hard because in this society, sugar is looked at as not a drug. It's looked at as just normal commonplace. So <clears throat> I, I'm inter interested in hearing from you sort of what are your thoughts on that? And, you know, are you a believer in, in like moderation or, or how do you, how do you sort of meet both of these worlds somewhere in the middle? It's a really good question because you can be that one man out. Right. And I mean, I wasn't a perfect parent. I, I mean, I learned all of this other stuff, you know, later in my life. So my kids had sugar when they were little, but it wasn't like a ton of candy and stuff, but still I baked and I did things at home. And I mean, there was sugar in my cookies, definitely. Um, so, you know, I can't stand here on a podium and say, oh, blah, blah, blah. 
but we do see more and more and we see more and more processed foods. Um, and it's, so it's not just in, you know, those, the candy, it's in the chips, it's in the crackers, it's, it's in, you know, everything. And, you know, we're using sugar as a reward. So we're training the brain that this is our, this is our treat. Now, what happened to the gold star system, right? Like what happened to that? Can we just get a sticker. <laughs> yeah, we get a sticker. But I mean, I did things with my kids, like, you know, beanie babies were huge when they were young and, and they would, you know, they wanted like more beanie babies. So it's like, okay, you do a chore, you get an arm, you get, you know, you do a chore, you get a head, <laughs> you get a chore, you get a tail, you know, and we, we kind of divided it up and we had the chart. Oh man, I, it was like child labor happening around our house, but we, <laughs> it had, you know, it was like for one summer when they were around six or seven and they had so much fun doing stuff because then they could, you know, go to the store and, and get their beanie oh. babies that they wanted. And they started to learn that, Hey, if I work, for this, uh, that, you know, I can get that, you know, and it was things like picking up walnuts, you get like, you know, a nickel for every wall, we had a big walnut tree, you know, it was a nickel for every walnut you pick up and yeah, fill the bucket and count them. And so there was a lot, you know, of learning with that. Yeah. It wasn't just, you know, but when it comes to like um, things with the family, so you try to provide other alternatives. Like sometimes, sometimes the cake is made out of melon, right? And I'll, I'll carve and stack watermelon and you know cantaloupe and honeydew and then put strawberries on top and it looks beautiful and every and you cut it you got all the layers and so it looks fabulous um there's no food coloring there's no dyes which send the kids crazy and us too because those are chemicals our body doesn't know what to do with and there's there's no you know that's natural sugar so it's still sugar but so it's more natural um the better no, alternative the better. yeah the better alternative you know once in a blue moon maybe i'll maybe i'll bake a cake um, but I don't put all the icing on it. Like it's things like that. Right. Um, for myself, I can't even tolerate it. So it's like, no, right. Yeah. So it's just not happening, but, um, that's my choice, but it's just, it's helping, it's helping, you know, people around me learn that there's, uh, there's different things for reward and there's different ways of doing thing. And, and yes, we can do that sometimes, but not all the time. And I think for parents with their kids, yes, you know, like maybe, you know, maybe they just pull it back a little bit. Yeah. Uh, if you think, you know, back, you know, back a hundred years ago, you know, there was sugar, but it was like, it was for birthday, right? It wasn't every day. You weren't going to the bakery every day to get a sweet treat. You yeah. weren't pulling something out of the cupboard every day. It, you know, what was in the cupboard was what was grown on the farm. Right. Yeah. And then maybe yeah. one, you know, maybe for a birthday, once in a while, you might have something special. So it, be, you know, it was more of the exception rather than three times a day and maybe four, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because <clears throat> gosh, this brings up so many thoughts, but I think that, you know, one thing that we do, you mentioned the healthier alternatives. I think that that's, you know, if you're a mother listening to this and you've got children who are going to the birthday parties and you're like, but what do I do? Like, how can I keep them like normal as part of society, but also kind of stick to knowing that you know, sugar is not healthy for them. And what can you do? There are so many alternative options out there um, that my, my family has also, uh, you know, played around with when it comes to that, to that kind of stuff. Number one, like I said before, when we go to, when my daughter goes to preschool, she takes her own snack every single day. I try to um, make sure that it's a healthy snack. I, we also try to stick underneath the 25 grams of added sugars a day. We are well beneath that because we don't do anything with added sugars, but she might take, you know, an apple. Usually she'll take a fruit. She might take some baby carrots. She might take some sort of fruit, vegetable. Um, she likes sun butter. That's a big thing in our house. She loves sunflower butter. So there's lots of things that like, if you can just sort of ingrain it into your child, right? That like food is not a reward, it is fuel. And like, I, I'm so proud of, of, of her at this, at this age. And I know that things will be challenging as we get older too, but she's at this age where she just understands, you know, and I think a lot of people have this misconception, like, oh, that poor child, like that poor child can't have the, the cupcake or they can't have the whatever. And it's like, she honestly is very happy with her bowl of strawberries. Like she, I promise you, she's not thinking about it the way you're thinking about it. You're looking at this as deprivation and she's not, this is just, this is what she's used to eating. There have been a couple of times where we've, we've had to say, you know, okay, let's, let's try a little bit of the sugar and see how you feel. And she'll mention like, oh, my belly hurts or, oh, I don't feel very good. Or I feel really tired after we leave the party. Right. And, and you have to also let your child experiment with that. 
You have to let them understand and feel the way their body's going to feel and then help them bring about that awareness if they do raise those concerns, right? Like if she does say, oh, why does my belly hurt so bad? Maybe say, well, you know, we did try the cupcake at the party. It could be part of the issue here, um, but that's okay. You know, you'll get, you'll get through it and let's have something else to make your belly calm down. Right. And so just bringing about that awareness for the, for the kids, I think is, is huge. I love that approach, Jenny, because um, when you make it taboo, it, it then, you know, then the kids tend to go all out when they get right. to, to their point of making the choices on their own. You have to let them experience things in, you know, in small quantities as it's appropriate and, and learn and look into, you know, learn and listen to that, that inner voice, right. That's that will tell them, like I said before, we, if we're quiet enough for our own body, we know what's going on, but we need to be trained that as a young child, because often that's just squashed, right. Yeah. It's squashed. And then we don't know how to trust our inner yes or our inner no. And it's really, um, it's really hard to learn when you're older. It yeah. really is. Um, you know, and if your child is used to having broccoli and carrot sticks and, you know, and squash on the table, that's, that's what their taste buds will acclimatize to. Mm -hmm. And they'll be happy and, and feel fine and satisfied. And that's what they'll reach for because they know that feels good in their body. Yeah. And then when they're out, you know, yeah, maybe they, maybe they will, they, if they can have a choice, send them with their own snacks in case they don't like what's there. Um, and they're hungry, right? So they're not forced to eat something that might make them feel bad. But if they want to go ahead and try it at the party, right? But every day standing, you know, on the everyday, you know, everyday healthy, you're going to the party. If you choose, you can try that. Here's some snacks in your bag in case you don't want it and you're hungry, yeah. right? And send the healthy snacks with them so that, yeah. you know, if they prefer eating their broccoli to the cupcake or their straw bowl of strawberries, that, that they have um, the power to, to look after themselves in a healthy way. Yeah. Yeah. And when, and you, that, were talking, when you were talking about women or, or you know, having clients who, <clears throat> who will oftentimes like, you know, binge the gummy bears or, or the sugar, um, it made me think of something, which is the fact that, I mean, I personally believe that most women are not fueling enough. They're not eating enough of the right foods. Um, I, I see this time and again, where I work with women and they send me a food diary and it's like, oh my gosh, like, how are you surviving off of, <laughs> off of this? Like, there's so many snacks throughout the day or, and it's not always candy. It's just, it's just crackers and, and lots of just processed foods, but not a lot of whole food ingredients and not a lot of robust meals. There's not a lot of um, healthy fats or, or nice, good, lean proteins. Like most women are not getting enough protein in their diet. When I look at their food yeah. diaries, I'm thinking, gosh, you're well under half of where you should be with your protein intake. And so it's no wonder that we're quick to grab, right? The sugary or the processed foods because our body is not nutritionally satisfied. 10 years ago, this, this um, doctor of nutrition was speaking and I was listening to him in the crowd. And he said, he said, you know, what happens if I gave you a banana and you were really hungry? So you're like, oh, thank you so much. I, you eat the banana. He's like, you know, and then five minutes later, I hand you another banana. He's like, are you going to eat it? And he's like, most likely you're going to look at me and be like, oh, yeah, I don't know if I really need another banana. Right. And so he said, but what happens if I give you a French fry? He's like, will you eat another French fry and another French fry and another French fry? He's like, so he, he equated it to this idea, this analogy that when our body is nutritionally satisfied with, with whole real foods, we don't crave more of them, right? That's a, it's a sign, right? Like our body has gotten what it needs from that banana most likely, and it doesn't need 13 bananas. Whereas with the French fries, those foods are designed to keep you eating them. Processed foods are designed to keep you eating them just like, you know, refined sugar is an addictive food. So you're going to continue to eat it and eat it and eat it. And to me, that just clicked in my brain as like, of course, of course that makes sense, right? Like, of course that makes sense as to why we should only be consuming whole foods because that's what's serving our body and that's what's giving us that fuel. So if you're a woman listening to this and you are like so many of us and you fall victim to the snacking and, and sort of the binging on, on certain little things, just know that taking a deeper look at your nutrition on a daily basis, like looking at how much you're eating each day, um, are you getting enough protein? Are you getting what you need to be consuming from real whole foods? Because if you're not, then that is most likely contributing a large part in a large part to how much, how much you're binging and how much you're sort of snacking throughout the day. So I, I don't know about you, but that's what I see. I see a lot of women are not eating enough of the right foods. They're having, you know, they're skipping breakfast. I see this all the time, skipping breakfast 
or they're having some sort of refined sugary granola bar or, or something like that for breakfast in the morning, they're having a small salad with a little bit of protein at lunch. And then they have this huge dinner and they binge all the snacks in the evening. Right. And that tends to be what happens is we catch up at the end of the day. Right. We're like, oh my gosh, like I have to eat, eat, eat because I'm, I'm starving. Cause I wasn't fueling myself appropriately throughout the day. Yeah, it's so true. And I mean, studies show that if you eat healthier fats first, first thing in the day, it's more sustainable. You're less apt to snack later on. And the, as you mentioned with the cravings, definitely, you know, um, an emotional craving is often the one that you start eating and you can't stop. Whereas a, um, bio, you know, a physiological uh, craving is meant to drive you towards a food that you need that nutrient in. And once you eat it, you're satisfied. You don't need to eat anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and foods are engineered and manufactured when they're processed, not only with the, with the fats, the sugar and the salt, but with the additives, with the food additives. If, if you look, there are chemicals that are um, designed for us to be addicted to that food that keeps us coming back. And this is what the fast food chains will do in order to keep you coming back. You become addicted to whatever it is because of their additives that they're, they're putting on. It could be in a shaker or something that they're adding in. Yeah. Um, so be, be aware of that, um, fueling your body early and well, and using the whole foods is, is definitely, um, the best, right? Definitely the best. Absolutely. So I do want to make sure that we touch on a couple of, of, of things. One being, um, you know, before we move on from, from digestive health and nutrition, I, I want to ask just quickly what your, what are your opinions on incorporating fermented foods into the diet? And then also sort of not related, but sort of related is, are you a fan of every person taking probiotics? Is that something that you recommend in your practice? Good questions, because I mean, there, there, there's lots of talk being done. There's lots of research done on the probiotics. And, you know, the nice thing for the manufacturers of the probiotics is that they can patent different strains. So now they can make some money off of it. And, you know, this is where they, the industry is exploding. And there are like millions of different strains that they can make. Um, now there is no one right, uh, perfect microbiome. We know that everybody is a unique fingerprint. We um, develop that from the time that we're in utero to about age three, we kind of get our basic fingerprint, but that can change with what we eat within 24 hours. So it's constantly changing, but our basic design is there by the age of three. Um, in order to keep feeding, um, we need, so we're feeding those, those microbes down there with, with the fiber like we talked before, but sometimes we, um, you know, like after a course of antibiotics or if we're on certain medications that deplete or alter the microbiome, then sometimes it makes sense to include a probiotic as a pill um, and then usually enteric coated is what you want. So it gets past the stomach acid and down into the intestines where you want it to work. Um, and you may choose that probiotic based on the condition. And there's different ones that you can choose for different reasons. Um, That could be a whole episode on its own talking about different things and and how they work and why you might choose one over the other. So sometimes, you know, for a time or in different disease conditions, some people with a FUT2 gene um, SNP, um, so an an aberration in or change in um, their genetic code makes it more difficult for them to maintain a healthy microbiome. Those, for those people, it might be um, advantageous for them to continue to take a probiotic while also you know, taking in the appropriate fiber so they can feed. And I like on those ones to kind of switch it up once in a while. And um, when you talk about fermented foods as a, as a part of the process of you know, feeding our gut, I mean, this is what our ancestors used all the time was fermented food. Now, you know, sometimes bad is good, so to speak, right? You let the food kind of go bad, but it's not really bad. You're just fermenting it. But there's a difference between a fermented food and a moldy food. So you want to be careful with that. <laughs> um, but fermented foods, I mean, you can ferment lots of different things. And um, when your gut is, is pretty healthy, it's not, you know, terribly off balance, it will tolerate the fermented foods well. But if you have a, an overgrowth in candida or some kind of dysbiosis where you become really histamine sensitive, then um, the, the, um, the fermented foods are, are actually a bit too much, mm-hmm. right? It can make you gassy, bloated, uncomfortable, you know, pain from the, the distension in the gut. Um, and so sometimes, you know, we're not quite ready for those. Um, but that being said, if you were to start with, say, say you're tolerant of some dairy and you're doing a milk kefir, you would start with a teaspoon a day, mm-hmm. right? Which doesn't seem like a lot. 
for those who aren't tolerant of milk and many who aren't and for other reasons as we talked about earlier you might not want to there is a coconut kefir that I just love there's a it's um, one that's come out of Canada on the east coast called the cultured coconut and it's now going worldwide it has four trillion CFU units wow. Four trillion. Most probiotics you're getting may have, you know, 10 or 50 or, you know, like the after antibiotic ones might have 500 billion, you know, or, you know, like you're talking about your VSL number three or your HMF, you know, 500 intensive for the brand name ones that are there. Um, ones like that that are really high. That's 500 billion. We're talking four trillion per tablespoon. And it wow. tastes good. It tastes good. And you just keep it in the fridge, take a tablespoon every morning. Um so I've been recommending that more and more since I learned about it and people tend to really love it. Um, but other types of fermented foods might be like kimchi or, you know, yogurt. Yogurts often get pumped with so much sugar and, and, yeah. and additives and stuff now, but um, at any rate, uh, just watch, you know, you want like the Greek yogurt typically is, um, you know, and you want the full fat because the full fat means less sugar. And it's higher in protein. So you're yeah. getting, you know, it becomes more of a, you know, more of a, a, a nutritional food at that point. Um, but then you have NATO, like fermented soybeans, and you have, because uh, it makes up the NATO kinase, which is really anti-inflammatory and people who did, you do well with soy-based products can tolerate it. It can be very helpful in, in different things. Um, there's so many, you, know, you can ferment carrots, you can ferment pickles. Like we, pickles we buy off the shelf are not fermented they're pasteurized in, in, in heat. Mm -hmm. Fermented things are in the fridge and don't get cooked because as soon as you cook it, you kill the bacteria. Right. Right. So you have to think of that. You have to, you want the fermented stuff. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of books and resources on the internet on how to ferment things. Um, it is a bit, you know, a bit of an art and a craft, but if you're starting, start low and slow um, and build up and you don't need a lot of it. It's more like a condiment. Right. Yeah, this is something that I just started incorporating into my diet in the last six months. And I was actually surprised at how much I enjoyed the flavors. I, I thought to myself like, Ooh, I've never really been one for pickled anything. Um, but when I started it, I thought it's actually quite tasty. I like to include, there's a, a brand, a brand that we have here in the U S called kraut and it's a, um, like a sauerkraut. They have all different types of things that they ferment, but I love their salad dressings. They have like fermented salad dressings that you can put on your salads and, it's just, it's, it's not what you, if you're listening to this and you're like, ew, it sounds terrible. Like, trust me, you just need to try, try different things and see how it works with you. Okay. So there are still a couple of things that I want to talk to you about before we, we head off. One is, I know that when we talked previously, we talked about the impact of, you know, your gut health and how it sort of plays a role in your overall sleep, like how sleep is sort of this like chicken or the egg thing. I know it's interesting because my husband has been doing a lot of the night work with our young one. So we have an 18 month old. She sleeps through the night most nights, but when she is up during the night, he's the one that, that goes to get her and, and soothes her. And it's interesting because usually the day after he's up during the night, he'll complain that his stomach feels off. He'll talk about how like, man, I don't know why I have such a stomach ache today. And I'm thinking, well, you didn't sleep. You know, you didn't sleep very well. I know for me, my stomach tends to be upset whenever I have sort of a disrupted night of sleep. So I would love to hear you make, a, make the connection for us between um, the gut and sleep and, and any tips on sleep hygiene that you might have for our listeners. Absolutely. Yeah, sleep is, I mean, if you're not sleeping, not much else is happening because sleep is not inactive. Sleep is a very active process of our body healing. Um, and you have to think your, your gut cells turn over every three to five days. That's a lot of turnover of cells. Right. And um, it's doing it, you know, constantly, but it's doing mostly in that, you know, fasting period, which is when we're sleeping. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so there's that side of it. But, there, you know, you have a biological clock rhythm, you know, that is by urinal, meaning, you know, day and night. And there's a reason we have day and a reason we have night. So there's a lot of active processes that happen during the day. And if 80 percent of your immune systems in your gut, guess what's, you know, guess what? Right. Like that's doing a lot of a lot of work there. Um, and, you know, we're 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 working on stuff and um, your gut microbes also have clocks. And when their clocks are in rhythm with our clocks, that symbiotic, you know, action, you know, working together hand in hand, you know, genes get turned on, this gets happening, you know, okay. And, and they move based on the timing to different parts of your digestive tract to do different jobs, right? It's like worker ants or worker bees, you know, like they're, they're, they're doing different things at different times in different areas. And they just know how to do that. They've got their, their migratory sense, but it's based on, you know, clock rhythms 
and what's happening. And I mean, this is, you know, why when, um, when you stay up late at night, you have a tendency to get sick more easily is because those clock rhythms get offset in the gut. And now the virus and bacteria that are not so nice, you know, the infectious ones, they're going, ah, ha, ha, opportunity, right? These guys are off their game, hit them hard, right? So this is, you know, this is what happens. And when you start burning the candle at both ends for too long, you start to get more sick. Plus it also puts, you know, the additional stress on the body because lack of sleep or disrupted sleep rhythms um, is another factor of stress and stress can disrupt the balance of the microbes in there. For all of these reasons, these things are all kind of chicken and the egg. They all, you know, what comes first. Sleep hygiene habits, um, top ones to think about rhythm and routine, just like your kids have, you know, okay, honey, your bedtime is eight o'clock, right? And it's a hard eight o'clock, you know, it's not 803. It's not, you know, it's, it's eight o'clock. We also need bedtime rhythms. We, we need to, you know, clean up from the day, pack our lunch for tomorrow, you know, wash our face, brush our teeth, set out our clothes, um, organize our stuff, you know, fluff our pillows, maybe read a black and white book, get away from our screens for an hour or, you know, um, before bed and um, keep the bedroom as a safe haven for sleep and sex. Um, that, you know, so your body knows what it's going to do when it goes in there clean it up. Don't have a bunch of hordes of, you know, stuff and piles and take the TV out of the bedroom, get your air, get your air quality good with a HEPA filter and temperature. we like a little cooler temperature when we sleep, get natural fibers that you're sleeping in that are cotton or silk or wool and, um, you know, feather, if you can handle it, if not get like an organic cotton pillow, um, you know, look at your mattress. What's it made of? Does it have, is it off gassing a lot of stuff? So air quality, air temperature, humidity, your humidity should be around 46 to 50% um, so that your nares, you know, your nostrils don't dry out so that you can sleep and you're not, con you know, congesting or itching or sneezing. Um, so, you know, you spend about half your life in your bedroom, mm -hmm. make it worthwhile, invest in good, you know, materials to make that a serene sanctuary for that time. Yeah. Uh, I invested in an aura ring this year. <clears throat> and so it's been a really insightful tool for me to see maybe where my sleep could, could improve. And it's interesting because I've always thought of myself as a good sleeper, right? Like I don't really wake up during the night that I know of. Um, and so, you know, when you, when you go to bed and you sleep seven hours and you think, okay, I didn't wake up. That's like you, for me, it was a good night's sleep. But when I started tracking with the aura ring and it started showing me that my REM was actually less than an hour per night, which is not ideal. I started thinking that for me, it was a challenge. It was like, what? Like, why would my, why would this be the case? Right. And so I learned for me in particular, I tend to be more of a night owl type personality. I'm not an early riser in the morning. Um, it seems to go against my biological clock to be up early. But for me, like I've noticed that if I can just push back that bedtime to a little bit before 11, my REM almost doubles. And so, you know, little things like that, like being more aware of, of your sleep routine or lack thereof, having that slightly earlier bedtime, making sure that you're prioritizing rest, right? The blue light blocking glasses are a big popular thing these days, you know, staying away from screens before, before bed. I love all the tips that you just gave. But for me, I would say the biggest difference maker that I've, I've had this year, um, I was able to, to lose about 15 pounds since January. And it was just for me, it was this inflammatory weight that I felt that needed to go. And I had tried everything through diet that I could try, right? Like I had increased my protein. I'm, I'm, I, I'm very active. Like I exercise five to six days a week. And I thought, well, why isn't this inflammation like going away? Like, why can't I seem to get rid of this? And the only change that I've made since January is focusing more on my sleep like making sure that I am recovering my body, that I'm paying attention to that recovery index, right? If it tells me that it's low, then it's not a good day for me to push. It's a day for me to rest and to listen to my body. So sleep is, is proving crucial for me. And um, I know it is for everyone else as well. Okay, so one thing that you had said to me on our previous call, and this is kind of how I want to wrap things up today. First of all, if, if you guys listening um, haven't already picked up on this, I love that, you know, just in general, functional medicine doctors are so in tune with how to help you implement lifestyle habits to really get to the root of anything that's going on for you. We've talked about testing just barely. We've barely scratched the surface. We talked about food sensitivity testing. There's so much more in the realm of, of hormones and everything. Maybe I'll have to have Dr. Brown on again for a second, a second, a part two of, of this episode, but 
Um, you know, what I love so much about naturopaths is that they have this, this inclination to really talk to you about your lifestyle, to really understand your sleep habits, to understand your nutrition, to, um, to help you better understand that and to make those lifestyle changes for the better. I find, you know, at least in my, in my experience, I think there's a place for modern medicine. There's certainly a place for, um, you know, lots of things in this world. But for me, I didn't start to make progress with my headaches. I didn't start to make progress with my weight. I didn't start to make progress with really understanding my body until I was in front of and with a functional wellness doctor. So I think if nothing else, I, I know that people listening to this are coming away saying, wow, like these are things that my doctor is most likely never talked to me about. And so I think we've, we've, we've at least scratched the surface here in shedding light for people as to what it looks like to, I think in your words, you use the phrase to prevent the fire versus to react to the fire. And I'd love for you to kind of give everybody the analogy of, of fire prevention like you did for me so that everyone can hear it. I have to remember what I said. That was kind of off the cuff. <laughs> yeah, but you have to, yeah. So you've got, um, you know, we talk about preventative medicine because um, you don't have to be sick in order to come see a functional medicine doctor or a naturopathic doctor. You can, you know, and often when you come in, we'll find something because nobody's perfect. We're always, our body's always trying to come back into balance. Uh, and there's stuff in the environment that's always pulling it away from balance and, you know, and then it tries to get back and it's like this elastic band. Right. Um, but if you, if you have so much going on, you could always just be fighting the fire, right? You're not really getting to the root cause of what's going on. And by looking at, you know, how the, how the body's knit together, how our, our emotions, um, our physical body, our spiritual body and our cognitive body, how these things are knit together and um, just, you know, just understanding and listening and asking about, you know, the different quadrants, the different things that stress us, because it's not just, you know, emotions that stress us, it's, you know, too much or too little exercise, too much or too little sleep or inflammation and infection, and these chronic infections that we kind of carry around. And it's, you know, it's kind of looking at, you know, what's out of balance. And then we're trying to, you know, work on that detoxification process to help the body detoxify so that it can do a better job getting back into balance. So coming, coming in and trying to find the root cause of what's going on, like there's a lot of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease out there. And, you know, this is a result of poor diet often um, that we're looking at, but the liver's downstream from the gut and it's directly downstream from the gut. So we got to go back to the gut and look at the gut. So, you know, being, being the, um, you know, you, you, you want to go in and do fire prevention in the gut, keep a healthy gut, right? What you eat makes a difference. The medication you take makes a difference. How you store your food makes a difference, right? We want, we want stainless steel and glass as much as possible, getting away from the plastics. Um, how you cook your food makes a difference, right? Frying and, and you know, the different things. Um, so so we, we use our food as medicine and you know, we feed our gut first and foremost so that it can take care of us, take care of it. It'll take care of us. Our belly is, is like, it's full of a, you know, it's like a bowl of goldfish and you've got to feed them every day and you've got to take care of them. Right. So it's taking care of things um, so that it can take care of you. And when we get down to that route, we're no longer just trying to figure out, Oh, we've got histamine, you know, intolerance. Oh, we've got a dairy intolerance. Oh, we've got this going on because when we bring the body back into balance and calm the nervous system, it becomes, you know, you know, a little more, you know, regular, a little more at ease, right? It's not di in dis-ease, it's at ease. And so this involves many different things. And, and I mean, stress is a huge component. We all see a ton of stress um, and, you know, working with the vagal nerve, working on that um, and recognizing the different aspects of stress helps us understand because um, stress is often like fighting the fire, right? Mm -hmm. And and, you know, when things are coming at us too quickly, we're overwhelmed and it's very difficult to parse apart. Mm -hmm. So I hope I answered that all right. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, that's been my experience that, you know, um, taking different, I mean, I was, I was the world's, I always like to say I was a guinea pig for, for migraine uh, research back in the, you know, 10 years ago, I saw dozens of neurologists and headache specialists. I was on 14 different prescription medications. Um, I've had neck surgeries. I've done Botox for migraine. I've done everything. And 
I, it wasn't until probably two and a half years into that journey that I didn't, I had my own epiphany that none of what I was doing was getting to the root cause that I just, to, to use your analogy, it felt for me like my body was on fire <laughs> and there was a lot of different firefighters trying to put out the fire, uh, but nobody trying to figure out where the fire was coming from. And functional wellness has done that for me. That's been my personal story. And um, it's my goal to bring, you know, to bring more awareness about this, this uh, root cause medicine to people's awareness. I think a lot of people are scared of it, at least in the USA. I think a lot of people are scared because it isn't covered on insurance or it's not part of what we would call um, a lot of, you know, it's not a modern medicine option for a lot of people. And so because of that, it deters people as opposed to really what could be a, be game changing for a lot of people out there. So I'm so grateful that you've taken time to spend, you know, your morning with me today and to, to shed some light on all of this with everybody, because number one, I'm super excited to read your book. I'm super excited to dig deeper into the concept of digestion and how it factors into our overall health. Um, but I also just think that there are a lot of people listening that needed to hear from you. They needed to, to sort of hear you know, this is, this is the knowledge of a functional medicine doctor. And this is what, this is what, you know, this type of, of, um, approach to your health can do for you is it can help you not only understand your body better, which is the ultimate goal, but it can also help you get to the root cause and, and keep you from being in that sort of fire mode, right? Like to, to sort of keep you proactively healthy is what I like to say, as opposed to reactively healthy. So I'm so grateful that you spent time with us today. I, I certainly did not get through all of the questions that I wanted to ask, but I think this is, we're definitely scratching the surface of, of a lot of things that can help people. Can you tell people, I know you mentioned that your book is pretty much everywhere. I know I found it on Amazon, but can you tell us just more about where people can find you and the book and anything else you want to point them to? Oh, thanks, Jenny. Um, and, and you're right. There are so many podcasts um, and people like you and I doing this because we're passionate about how this type of approach in healthcare has helped us individually. So we're passionate about sharing that with others. And there are countless ones. You mentioned Mark Hyman. I've done some training with Chris Kresser um, and, and the list just goes on. There's, there's lots out there and people can learn a lot and just arm themselves with better questions, right? Needs, we all need body literacy. We, we live, we come with one body. It changes through a course of time and we really ought to learn more about how to take care of it. I do a lot of um, podcasts like this um, I'm on LinkedIn, so you can, you know, I've got my LinkedIn handle. I do a lot of posts on things that I find just, you know, off um, uh, research when, when I'm preparing for things. I'll often like, oh, this is cool, and I'll send it out there. Um, my website is South End Guelph, so um, South End, and then G um, U E L P H dot C A, so South End Guelph dot C A. Um, that, and I do a lot of uh, blogs and posts on there on different things. Uh, the book is Amazon mostly um, worldwide. Uh, I can give you links for that if you want to put them up. And um, yeah, and then I'm in my clinic <laughs> treating patients. So yeah. Yeah. Well, I will link everything up in the show notes so that everybody can find you on LinkedIn and they can, they can hit your website. I'll also link up the book so people can do easy purchase that way through Amazon. Um, thank you again so much for being with us today. I'm so glad our paths have crossed. I've learned so much from you in just the short amount of time that we've been able to hang out. So thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thank you. Thank you for doing this too, because there's so many people out there that, um, that just need to hear about how hormones work and how nutrition can be, um, you know, food can be medicine. That's great. Thanks so much, Jenny. Absolutely. Thanks. You take care.